Christian Heritage Ministry, in cooperation with Fuller Seminary, proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Cole. Welcome in an old-fashioned revival hour. Welcome. As you sing through the first time, turn around and shake hands with as many as possible. Bob, wow, we're glad to see so many here today at the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium. Now really lift it up on Heavenly Sunshine all together. Heavenly Sunshine. Turn around and give everybody a good handshake. You want to be here, friends, in the radio audience. Wonderful time of fellowship. Try 
there's something you can do before you sing the next verse, sing one verse of Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Go ahead, Rudy, you know the key. Everybody knows that old song. All right. Blessed Assurance. Sing it out, everyone. Revival Hour, coming to you from Long Beach, California. And I'm sure that you realize that the ministry of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour is a faith work, continued year after year, because so many of you have been so faithful. May God richly bless each and every one of you as you've stood by this ministry. However, in these critical days, we need many more friends who will take this work upon their hearts and remember it daily before the throne of grace. If you would join us in this evangelistic, soul-saving ministry, will you not write us this week assuring us of your prayers? Thanking you so much. Our mailing address is... Old Fashioned Revival Hour, 700 Locust Street, Pasadena, California, 91101.
and everybody, too. All right, honey, go right ahead with the letters, Mrs. Fuller. Greetings, friends. That was a good song, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, we've had some wonderful letters this week from, from all over the world. Some very, very warm, fine letters from 
Europe and from Britain. Dear Dr. Fuller, I am another who has listened for years to you and have wanted to write but never got around to it. I heard you at home as a child, and I'm now the wife of a wonderful man studying to prepare for the ministry, and we have two lovely children. But it was 13 years ago, last January the 15th, that I was saved listening to the old-fashioned revival hour after coming home from our own church. I remember it so vividly. As a result of my going to my dear mother and telling her of my desire and decision to follow Christ, she realized that she wasn't living as close as she could, and she got right with God. Later, my daddy came back to God, and then ours was such a happy family. Because of all this, in my memory, you can realize why the old-fashioned revival hour means such a lot to me. A man writes a good letter from a southwestern state from the death row in prison, saying that he would like to have a letter from Mr. Fuller. He said, The time has been set in which the law says that I must pay with my life. I know sin doesn't pay. I know it's wages. But I also believe that the gift of God is eternal life. Surely you will not be offended if I write to you, Mr. Fuller. My past has been dark. I am 23 years of age, and I am a young lad who has tasted of wild ways in the world. I sit here in my cell alone. Slowly the clock ticks away the hours and the moments that I have left, without one true friend in the world. Mr. Fuller, I have heard you preach. I know you are concerned about souls, about my soul, and I want you to pray for me, please. I would like to have a letter from you. Well, of course, a letter has gone to this man, and we do pray that his need has been met, his need of Christ. And this last letter is a good, thoughtful one from a lady whom I believe to be a Dutch person, a missionary in China, an ex-missionary in China, and a listener and friend of the old-fashioned revival hour, dear Reverend Fuller. This short, stuttering letter cannot tell you what a deep blessing we are receiving listening to your radio messages and how we enjoyed them in China. How long? I don't know. A few years, probably ten. We were in Shanghai when we heard you for the first time. It was a beautiful, heart-searching message and such lovely music. My heart was wide open, and I could not continue then to be a lukewarm Christian after I had heard. As a prodigal daughter, I got up and went to my father. Oh, I knew him. I already was his child, redeemed by the blood of Christ. But I followed him afar off. I asked him to give me an opportunity to serve him and to be his witness, and he answered my prayer and gave me this blessed opportunity. When the last world war came to China... What a comfort and joy it was to hear your dear voices from America. Now we had to leave China, and we chose to come to the USA. I was looking forward to meeting those wonderful Christians who sent so many missionaries to China. But when we attended the church we belonged to, we found it so modern that there was no place for the Bible as God's word. We were very unfortunate to see many such. And then we heard your radio program, and it gave us courage and joy, joy in the Lord. Now I know that in the USA are more than 7,000 of all the knees which have not bowed unto modernism. Praise the Lord. But your voice was first to encourage me to stay firm at the cross of Jesus, my Redeemer, and to keep the word of God pure in my testimonies. Thank you, dear brother, for your helping hand on the way to our Father's home. And that is all I shall have time for today, friends. Sometimes the shadows gather and mists obscure the way. Sometimes the clouds grow heavy and darken all the day. How precious to remember our Father's loving care. And he still loves his children, and he answers prayer. Keep on believing the 
Father, we thank thee for thy gracious promise that if we walk in the light as thou art in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, thy Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we thank thee that though our sins may be as scarlet, they can be washed as white as snow through the shed blood of thy beloved Son. And today as we look into thy mirror, thy looking glass, and see the human heart that is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked, as thou dost outline the potentialities of the human heart for deep sin. We thank thee for the only remedy for cleansing that heart is the blood of Jesus Christ. How precious to us today. Save souls, for we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Sometimes our skies are cloudy and dreary, sometimes our hearts are burdened with care, but we may know whatever may befall us, Jesus is always there. Never a burden that he doth not carry, never a sorrow that he doth not share. Whether the days may be sunny or dreary, Jesus is always there. When we are walking through the green pastures, or over mountains rugged and bare, precious the thought and sweet the assurance, Jesus is always there. 
Listening to the Old Fashioned Revival Hour with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. His message today is titled Alienated from God. I'll provide additional information after Dr. Fuller's message. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17, as we rejoin the broadcast. Jesus rose 
And please take your Bibles and turn to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, beginning at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. A fourfold picture of the human heart, alienated from God, is the subject today. And I know at the end of the broadcast, some will say, Brother Fuller, my heart is not quite that black. And yet I say back to you that in your human heart, unregenerated, you have all the potentialities that are outlined in these three verses that I've just read within you. God is no respecter of persons, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now the church of Jesus Christ, the church embracing all truly born-again believers, still lives in a godless world, an evil world system among ungodly, unrighteous people. And this church is in the world and, of course, should not be of the world. And it behooves us who have been delivered from the power of darkness and have been translated into the kingdom of his dear Son to pause at times on the wilderness journey to consider from our former condition. And by comparing that which we now have in Christ Jesus with that which we were without Christ should cause us to rejoice and to be truly thankful for the great redemption we have in him. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, in this epistle, we find God's first revelation of all those who by nature are children of wrath, of those who are energized by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and who are now walking according to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all unregenerated sinners are in that group without distinction. In Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, we have God's second revelation of all unsaved sinners. God's enlarged portrait of the human heart, deceitful above all else, and desperately wicked. And in a few short verses, the great physician lays bare the human heart in its natural, unregenerated state. It is rather a terrifying picture to see the human heart without God, without Christ, without hope, vile, sinful, impure, and capable of, mo of the most diabolical atrocity. That's not very popular, is it? Not very popular preaching, but I want to be true to God's Word and stir you up who are dead in trespasses and sins that the Holy Spirit may lead you to the foot of the cross and be saved. Now four aspects of the unregenerated heart is set forth here. And since all have sinned, since all by nature are guilty before God, here then is God's true portrait of your own heart, friend of mine, outside of Christ. After you see your own sinful condition, may the Holy Spirit lead you gently to the one and only fountain of eternal cleansing, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now notice, please, in these verses, we who are now saved, we see we were once spiritually dead, alienated from the life of God. Second, we were once in mental darkness. Notice, through in the 18th verse, because of the blindness of their heart. Third, we were once in the state of moral degeneracy. Past feeling, verse 19, and forth in the state of physical depravity to work all uncleanness. Oh, I know some of you say that doesn't fit me. Yes, it does. Hits you right between the eyes if you'll only stop and consider it for a few moments. Or except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is not a pleasant picture, I grant you, but one that God unveils to show us 
that in ourselves we are utterly hopeless, utterly incapable to walk pleasing in God's sight, and only the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse and can wash us white as snow and loose us from our sins and make us new creations in Him. All other ground is sinking sand. Beginning at verse 17, I say therefore and testify, that is, I call you to witness, I declare solemnly that ye walk no longer as you formerly walked in your unconverted days in the vanity of your mind. And the word vanity means emptiness, unprofitableness, unfruitfulness. In your unconverted days, walking in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the mind, your life, your natural life, was empty, useless, fruitless, to no eternal purpose, void, restless, profitless. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And in the twelfth of Luke, We have a picture of a man who lived for this life. Let me read it to you briefly. He spake a parable unto them, saying, For the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, fixed for this life. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. My, now notice it. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And there you have a picture of a man living for self, empty, fruitless, unprofitable, alienated, and so forth from the life that's in Christ. Now notice, beginning at verse 18, we find two causes for one's vanity of mind. And may the Holy Spirit burn these words of verse 18 into your heart, and may they ever ring in your memory. First, cause for being profitless, empty, void, unprofitable, fruitless, is this. And I trust that across the nations today, this word may ring out, alienated from the life of God. It goes right to the very heart of things. Every person by nature, every sinner by nature, is alienated from the life of God. Now the word alienated means, listen carefully, rendered foreign, strange, belonging to another, not as one's own, to be shut out from one's fellowship. You, my sinning friend, are shut out from fellowship with God You are alienated, made a stranger to the life of God. And you belong to another, even Satan, who is your master, for you are a branch of the false vine. I haven't time to go into the third of Genesis at any great length, but you remember the first two chapters, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, with no curse, no night, no pain, no tears, No crying, no sorrow, in perfect relationship and fellowship with God with a work to do to dress the garden. But in the third chapter, the old serpent, Satan the devil, comes in as a bright, shining, angelic being. And he says to Eve, Yea, hath God said. And the trouble there is that Eve and Adam listened to the lie. Listen to Satan, the father of lies, and they sold themselves in the possession of another. And immediately they fled from the presence of God, and they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, alienated from the life of God. And the moment that they believed that lie and sinned, they died spiritually, and later 
died physically, alienated from the life of God. Listen, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Now note, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. No middle ground. John 3.15 That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Alright. In your unconverted state, you are alienated. You are alienated from the life of God. All right. The second reason. You are in mental darkness. Spiritually blinded. Second Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And down over the eyes of every unregenerated believer, irrespective of your social standing, Satan has a blind over your eyes. You're in mental darkness. You cannot see spiritual things. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. These things are spiritually discerned. You are blinded, spiritually blinded, my unsaved friend, and walking in darkness, a blind leader of the blind. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If therefore the light that is in thee, you're following human reasons and human leaders and human thoughts. If the light that is in thee, you're saying, well, I'm doing pretty well. I'm all right. God will take account of my works of righteousness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, spiritual darkness, how great is that darkness? And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Why do they always do the dirty works of sin under the cover of darkness? Because your deeds are evil and you love darkness. John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 12, 35. He that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Now the preaching of the gospel has a wonderful purpose. Several purposes, in fact. One is to open the eyes, to turn men from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. The first thing that the gospel does is to open your eyes, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling and the glory of your inheritance in the saints. Now notice, strangers to the life of God, alienated, darkened. I plead with you on the old-fashioned revival hour to come to the light, receive forgiveness of sins, and possess your inheritance in Christ. An unsaved friend, not only alienated and darkened, unless you repent, you'll be in the state of moral degeneracy. Past feeling, given over unto uncleanness, becoming insensible to all feeling, giving oneself in complete abandonment to the lust of the flesh, a slave to all uncleanness, rebellion against restraint, lawlessness, licentiousness, unbridled lust, shamelessness, as in the days of Noah. Yes, I'm talking to you. You know what I'm saying is absolutely the gospel truth. You have no power over that in burning lust in yourself. And you'll come to a point, unless you repent, I say it on the authority of God's Word, you'll come to a point where if you keep on sinning, you'll become past feeling with your conscience seared. And God says not to pray for you. It'll be a sin unto death. And you might as well just shuffle off this mortal world. Keep on sinning. You'll come to a place where there'll be no 
feeling towards God, without hope, without God, without Christ. But I hasten to say that if there's the slightest feeling or yearning to be saved, come now. I'm giving you the gospel truth. As in the days of Noah, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. We're having right now before us in this world, look about you, the repetition of the days of Noah, violence among the nation, and the repetition of the days of Lot, immorality, licentiousness abroad in the land. The Lord's coming to execute judgment. Now, in conclusion, the fourth thing that God tells us about the human heart, not only alienated in mental darkness and past feeling, but He tells us that there is physical depravity. Oh, yes. It's closely allied with moral degeneracy. Now, notice in verse 19, it says, to work all uncleanness with greediness. The business of every kind of uncleanness, physical and moral, to take advantage of, to wrong, to defraud, a greedy desire to have more than's coming to you, to be covetous. And if one persists, God will give you up. I said a moment ago, past feeling, eternally separated from God. Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Let me quote you this passage in closing. I realize that full four, full four, uh, fourfold picture is a dark picture, but it's God's picture. Now notice. Will you give close attention, please? For if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of truth, and I've given you the knowledge of truth. If you go on sinning, there'll be no hope. For if we sin willfully, After that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. It's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. You're going to have to meet God regardless of who you are. And he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Dare you trample the blood of Jesus Christ any longer under your feet? If you do, God have mercy on your soul. He said, I am not willing that any should perish. I've provided the way and I'm waiting. Come now. Him that cometh unto me, God says, oh, no wise cast out. Let's bow our heads in prayer. No one stirring. Bowed in his presence, God is speaking to you. God knows your heart. You may fool men, but you can't fool God. He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. He says, come now. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Friends outside of Christ in the radio audience, flee to the Lamb of God. Come and kneel by faith at the foot of the cross and let the precious blood of Christ cleanse you and make you a new creation in Him. Whosoever will may come, come now. While our heads are bowed in this splendid visible audience in Long Beach today, How many will quickly put their hands up and say, Brother Fuller, I need Christ as my personal Savior. Pray for me. Shoot your hand up and say, By the hand going up, I need Christ as my personal Savior. Remember me in prayer. You need Christ. We must bring the hour to a close. Continue in prayer. This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye. And God's richest blessing upon you.